Hey, how's it going? Hey, hi, Stephen. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How's, uh, how are you today? Doing good, doing good. Uh, how are you? Doing well. <clears throat> Thanks for joining and uh, presenting today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are, are you also in the Pacific time zone? Uh, I'm on the uh, East Coast, US. I got it, got it. It's, you're it's... you're in Pacific. Uh yeah, I'm I'm based out of San Francisco. Sure. Nice. Uh, Ricardo's out there as well. Um, the uh, one of the co-chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. First of all, like thanks, thanks for inviting us. Um, uh, we are super excited to be here and um like just to give some preface like we want to sort of get you guys' feedback on what you think about the project and sort of like help us ideate you know where can we take this project sounds great um yeah hopefully some other folks join give them a couple minutes <laughs> So these meetings happen every two weeks or so? Yeah, we do first and third Thursdays of the month. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess twice a month. So yeah, it's a chance to, uh, you know, see a bunch of uh, different projects, things that are going on in the, in the community, um, anything runtime related. Runtime is such a broad category, really. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, uh, you guys are right in the in the thick of that um, that concept. But you know, runtime goes all the way down to like container D as well. Like <laughs> there's a wide range of and like the OS level. So, um, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. How did yeah, you get started? Been... Um, so you know, I I was a graduate student at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and a lot of my past research has sort of looked at scheduling and resource management with a focus on machine learning workloads. So looking at, you know, how can you more efficiently design more efficient schedulers for these workloads? Mm -hmm. um, and then we eventually came up, uh, like, while I was working on these problems, I noticed that, like, the other machine learning folk in our lab, they were struggling with just like getting their workloads up and running. Like efficient scheduling is like a completely different problem. You first need to get from like, get off the ground and get something running. Um, and so then we sort of like came stumbled across this problem where, you know, people, at least in our lab, wanted to use many different clouds and like have their jobs run seamlessly across different clouds and locations. Um, but it was like really hard to make that happen because you had to learn like all these different APIs and so on. Um, so that's that's really the genesis of this project. We sort of like started by trying to build this sky where you know you can uh, submit a job and like Skypilot takes care of running it anywhere. I'll, I'll talk more about it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's 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 how we started. Awesome. Very cool. We can get started, right? Awesome. Yeah, let's let's go ahead. Why don't you dig in? Is it uh, Ro Ro Romil? Yeah, Romil. Romil, why don't you take take it away? Perfect. Uh, awesome. Let me just set up set up my share, uh, screen sharing really quickly. Oh, just give me a second. It's asking me to restart Zoom. Uh, I'll just be back in a minute. Of, of course, no worries.
why is conference meeting are always complicated? Yeah, and definitely don't do it in Linux. <laughs> yeah, I think we should have some thing on the notes about Linux, right? <laughs> but how difficult yeah. it is. It's true. I haven't used uh, Zoom on Linux ever, I think. So. This is the, have you ever shared via Zoom test part of the meeting? Sorry about that. Let me yeah. share this. It's all good. Uh, all right. Um, so, okay, perfect. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Slides? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me here. I'm I'm Romo. I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, where I work on this project called SkyPilot. And the goal of SkyPilot is to really uh, make it super easy to run AI anywhere, and at the same time also provide some additional features like cost savings and making it uh, finding new GPU capacity wherever it's available. So I'll I'll start by saying that running AI on the cloud today is difficult and expensive. Um, and let me elaborate on these two points. So if you if you look at a typical AI workflow today, first for an ML engineer, you have to pick between multiple clouds if you have access to multiple clouds. Once you pick the cloud, you need to pick between different regions where you want to run a job. Then you have to choose between zones. And then finally, you also have to choose which exact GPU you want to use amongst like a plethora of GPUs. Once you've made this decision, you need to provision your instance. Uh, so you say you pick AWS and you say, I want to use V100s, you typically go to the cloud console or maybe use a CLI or Terraform to like uh, provision that VM and get that up and running. Once it's running, you need to transfer your data onto it. Um, you need to run some setup, like either uh, run your Docker container or install uh, some dependencies you might have, a specific CUDA version you might be using. And then once all of this is set up, you you also have the responsibility of managing your jobs. You have to manage multiple nodes in your cluster, make sure all of them are healthy and up and running. And then you may also have to manage this across clouds and clusters. You may have a Kubernetes cluster, which is provided by your organization. You may, you may be on AWS, you may be on GCP and so on. So if you look at this, this brings a lot of complexity, especially for an ML engineer who's trying to just get their training script or their small inference script up and running. First, they must choose from hundreds of choices of uh, clouds and accelerators and the regions and the locations they can run. Next, they have to deal with availability, which is a big problem today. So if you've looked at the news, um, GPUs are in short supply. Uh, you know, there's if you if you try to provision uh, a P4D 24 large, which is like an A100 instance on AWS, you'll almost never get it. Um, and there's like a lot of media coverage about it as well. And then finally, even if you do manage to get a GPU, you still have this infra management burden, which is typically in large organizations, it's taken care of by a large DevOps team, which does this. But for fast moving generative AI workloads where they really want to like try out the latest cutting edge hardware, it's really hard for them to sort of have the DevOps team catch up with them. Uh, and that wastes a lot of cycles for them. So it's, it's not just about the complexity, but also the cost of running uh, big models. So if you if you look at this chart, um, it's it's slightly old now, um, given how fast things are moving. But if if you if you compare the training cost over time, uh, the record setting costs of, of the most expensive models have grown exponentially. And here you can see training Llama one, not even Llama two, was north of one million dollars, and I think Llama two was around like eighty million or something. So you do need to spend a lot of money to get these ML models up and running. And 
this is also quantified by uh, A16Z uh, in, the, in this article where they say that many companies spend more than 80% of their total capital raised on compute resources, especially if they are like a very AI-centric startup. So our goal oh, with SkyPilot is to really- oh, no, question. Oh, yeah, so how, what, are, what is the uh, cost based on? Is that only on compute or, or they, they, they didn't actually say what it was based on? I'm oh yeah, the, the article, uh, yeah, the article mentions this as solely as a capital expenditure for getting GPUs up and running. Uh, and this could also be rented from the cloud, but most eighty percent of this is like this means the spend on GPUs. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Thanks. Cool. So, um, and yeah, uh, please feel free to like interrupt at any point for questions. Uh, very happy to take them as we go. So uh, our goal with SkyPilot is really to make running AI both simple and cost effective. And this is largely driven by the sky computing vision that our lab shares, where we really want to, uh, our goal is to make compute uh, a commodity where, you know, just like how you plug in your laptop charger into the wall and it just start, starts charging. We have a similar vision where you, you just compute your workloads. You say, so you just plug your workloads into SkyPilot and then SkyPilot will get you access to resources wherever they are available without you having to worry about the infrastructure behind them. And in, in this vision, the way, the way we think about uh, these applications running on different clouds is uh, they all talk to the different clouds through what we call an intercloud broker. An intercloud broker is basically, uh, you can think of it as like a thin layer which decides where to place a task or an application based on what are its resource requirements and some other optimization metrics such as cost. So more, more concretely, SkyPilot is our intercloud broker for running AI on any cloud. And it handles all the cloud infra for you while, max, while saving cost and maximizing GPU availability. And at a very high level, this is how it works. So at the top, you have your program, which can be any uh, AI, any application, any process, any shell script, really. Um, you, you could be using Docker, you could be using Ray, you could be using any of these frameworks. And you submit your program to SkyPilot along with the resource requirement, like, hey, I need eight A100 GPUs, and then SkyPilot takes care of uh, running, those, uh, running that uh, program across different clouds and regions. And it takes care of picking the best location, provisioning resources in that location, managing the runtime of your job, and then cleaning up after your job is completed. And it's it's not only limited to the big three clouds. So when we started, we started by building out support for the big three clouds ourselves. But after that, when it started taking off, we had all these smaller clouds come together and willingly contribute support for uh, their cloud to SkyPilot, which is getting us closer to the sky vision where it, there, it's, it's, there's an incentive for cloud providers to join this kind of platform or this kind of uh, initiative because everyone but the incumbent want people to be able to easily move between different cloud providers. So, um, we, we, it's, it's been very exciting to see uh, this grow and sort of like people add support for their own clouds to SkyPilot. Uh, so really quickly, um, it's, we run solutions. Sorry. Okay, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I'm sure you're going to get a, get into this as well. Um, does like clearly GPUs have sort of a, like there's a, a minimum cost or kind of a fixed cost in, in some way. Uh, like mm -hmm. you have to pay for it uh, somehow. Um, does some of your advantage here come from kind of the automated cleanup perspective and just, you know, not leaving things around or kind of running it uh, in an optimal way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's actually a funny story uh, in our lab where a student burned nearly $30,000 worth of credit just by leaving some instances on over the Christmas break. 
Sure. Uh, and after that, we sort of added this feature to like auto stop instances or like auto kill instances after your job is done. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, so we don't quantify it because that's you know hard to quantify how much exactly you save there. Uh, but that's a big part of the value add that people see in like reducing costs. Gotcha. Thanks. Cool. Um, I I'll keep going then. So um, before before I dive into the technical details, uh, just like a quick uh, overview of where we are today. So um, we run this as an open source project uh, on GitHub. You can try it out right now if you just do pip install sky palette. Um, we uh, we we are very uh, glad to have uh, so many contributors and lots of GitHub stars. Um, and according to some very crude telemetry that we have, uh, we know that over 150 VMs, 150,000 VMs were launched in 2023. And Skypilot is in use at uh, some some small to medium sized startups such as Covariant. Uh, most recently, uh, Mistral AI, uh, which released a big model um, and were fairly popular. Uh, use Skypilot to sort of distribute their models to users. And then we also have people using Skypilot for non-AI workloads as well, such as the Salk Institute of Biosciences down in San Diego, uh, who use Skypilot to process uh, data generated from their wet lab. Uh, and this is like a daily job that runs every day uh, on uh, spot instances. Um, and yeah, just like more signals of people using Skypilot. Uh, VLLM is a very popular inference engine that also uh, supports using Skypilot. And we have like other people also integrating with Skypilot. Uh, so yeah, before before I dive deeper into you know how how it works, um, any other questions? This is great. Yeah, I'm glad to see this and being an open source and being available for folks to scale their AI workloads. Cool. Uh, thank you. So I'll I'll keep going then. Um, so the question, so the so we we've talked about what Skypilot does at a high level, but why exactly do people want to use Skypilot to run their AI jobs? So one of the biggest things we do is remove the cloud infrastructure burden for um, AI engineers and researchers. So if you look at a typical machine learning project, it's it has some form like this, where you have a working directory, where you have all your code, some training scripts, and so on. Uh, you have a setup where you, know, you need to specify some dependencies uh, that you need to install, or maybe a Docker container. And finally, uh, you have a run section, which basically is a shell script, which runs your training script along with some pra uh, parameters you might configure. So Skypilot translates all of this into a clean YAML, where you specify your current work directory on your machine. So this slash project is a local path on your laptop. Uh, then you specify a setup where you can do pep install or Docker pull or um, any any kind of pre-launch setup that you want to do. And then finally, you have a run section where you just say Python train.py or you know, whatever shell script you want to have there. In addition to this, uh, you specify two more things in Skypilot. The first is you want to specify the resources that you need to run your job. So for instance, uh, here I'm saying I need eight A100 GPUs to run, run this task. And second thing you need is to specify the file mounts or the input data to your job. So this could either be on a cloud bucket or it could be locally on your machine. If it's on a cloud bucket, we will transparently mount this bucket using fuse mounting. Or we, or if this data is local to your machine, we'll copy it over to your remote cluster. And that's it. Once you've defined this YAML, uh, you just uh, do sky launch with this task YAML, and then Skypilot takes care of like picking the best location, provisioning, running your job, and then getting you the logs and the outputs. 
Do you support uh, other languages like besides Python for, for this kind of workflow? <laughs> Just curious. Oh, so yeah, this this these can be like so Python is just one example. Uh, this could be arbitrary uh, any shell script. Like you could just do, do echo hello world. Sure. Uh, okay, I got you. So set up and run is basically whatever the the user wants. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I guess the typical workflow for data science would be like a, a Python packages, right? So, but I mean, it could be any any other language, right, or any other executable. Yeah, yeah, it yeah it could literally be any executable, uh, and you can just run that. Um, that said, you know, I, I I've shown only the YAML interface here. Uh, we also have a Python API if you want to do these things programmatically, so you're not like bound to. Uh, using the YAML. Can, can you talk about how, like, what best means? Like, kind of the 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 choices mm -hmm. that, and and how um, can you influence uh, what what the best location is via some kind of hooks or tags or something? Hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a great point. Um, I'll get to that now. Um, so just to give you a short answer, for right now, best means lowest cost that's available right now. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I'll I'll go through that now. Sure. So one of the goals of SkyPilot is to maximize GPU availability in a time where it's really hard to get GPUs today. Uh, so let's start with the example where you have access to just one cloud, but you have multiple regions available to you. So when you do Sky Launch asking for eight A100 GPUs, SkyPilot will take care of, uh, SkyPilot will go through a catalog, which I'll talk about, more about soon. It'll go through that catalog and figure out the cheapest GPU for you on AWS across all its regions, which satisfy this resource requirement that you requested. So it finds you can get GPUs in US East one. Then it tries to provision there, and if provisioning there would fail, it would automatically fail over to the next cheapest region that's available on AWS. So next it would go to EU West one, which is slightly $3 more expensive, but it'll try to provision there next. And if that also fails, then it'll go to other regions on AWS. So this kind of like automatic failover handles all capacity or quota errors transparently to the user, because for them, it's really just like getting access to GPUs. They, don't really care about which region it's running on. And this is a trend that's generally, we have found generally to be true for like AI developers, where because their workload, <clears throat> because their workloads are not very latency sensitive, they don't really care which region they're running on. And they just want to, you know, get their workloads up and running. Uh, similarly, if if you have multi-cloud access, say you have access to Lambda Cloud, Azure, GCP, and maybe other clouds, uh, then SkyPilot can do this optimization over clouds. So it'll go through all the cloud catalogs that it has, and then try to figure out which is the cheapest cloud, try to provision their post. And if that doesn't work, then it'll like spill over to other clouds and regions. And more recently, we have started extenders, extending this definition of cloud to include anything that can grant you resources, because that's really what a cloud does, at least for SkyPilot. So we we are now bringing Kubernetes into this fold where you can bring your own Kubernetes cluster. It could be your on-prem cluster or um, some cloud-hosted cluster. And it can be injected in the same way into the SkyPilot workflow, just like any other cloud. And so what this allows you to do is if for an organization which has an on-prem cluster, they can easily leverage those resources while also transparently spilling over to the clouds uh, for elasticity. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, with Kubernetes, uh, you could actually have Kubernetes nodes that have CPUs and GPUs. So is there is there a way for SkyLaunch to determine which uh, Kubernetes nodes, uh, uh, and also 
I think a related question is that with all these clouds, I mean, uh, uh, they all have GPUs, but it all, they also have like CPU VMs. So that does mm -hmm. it also like determine uh, that it needs to run on GPU type of uh, environments or, 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 or GPU servers? Yeah, so so uh, SkyPilot here, like you can see on the left, you specify a resource requirement. And if you have GPUs, then we'll only provision instances which have those specific GPU. If you don't specify this, then we'll only provision a CPU instance. Um, actually, maybe I can quickly show you guys this. Uh, can you see my terminal? Yeah. yeah. Uh, perfect. So if I do something like sky launch C, uh, so I'm just giving it a name, my cluster. So what it's doing right now, it's running its the optimizer, trying to figure out which is the cheapest location. And now it's printed out a list of the clouds that will try to launch on in what or in the specific order it will try them. So it tries Kubernetes first uh, because I've set its cost to zero because it's like an on-prem cluster that I use. Uh, if that would fail, for instance, if the cluster is occupied or there's like no no resources available, then it'll spill over to AWS. If not, then Azure, then IBM, GCP, Fluidstack, Lambda, and so on. Uh, at the same time, if I add a GPU requirement, like I need one V, oh, sorry, if I need one V100 GPU, uh, now my Kubernetes cluster won't be listed anymore uh, because it doesn't have any GPUs. So now it says, okay, I'll try on fluid stack first. And if that doesn't work, I'll go to IBM Cloud, then GCP, AWS, Azure, and so on. Uh, that makes sense. So, so it's dependent on the accelerators. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you can also optionally specify how many CPUs you need. So I can say I need eight eight plus CPUs or more than eight CPUs. Uh, and then you know it'll change the resource request to using eight CPUs. You can similarly specify memory, disk, so on. Makes sense. Cool. Um, it's cool. So the yeah. So so the way SkyPilot works is um, you. So behind behind the scenes, what happens is when you request these eight A one hundred GPUs, SkyPilot maintains a catalog, and this catalog is also up on GitHub as a separate repository. It's it's like a, you can think of it as a collection of very simple CSVs which contain information about each cloud's offerings and their prices. And this is like updated daily. And basically what SkyPilot does is it, it looks at your resource request and then it looks at the catalog and tries to find the offerings which match your resource request. Then this catalog is consumed by the optimizer to figure out what is the best location. And now we have different optimization policies, like uh, like you asked, Stephen, where you know you can either optimize based on cost, which is the default metric right now. Uh, we have some collaborators who are doing a very interesting research pro project on like, can you optimize on minimizing uh, carbon emissions of your workloads? So instead mm -hmm. of cost as a metric, you have gram CO2 equivalent as the price you pay for running a workload. And then SkyPilot will optimize for that. So there's like different metrics that you can choose to optimize for. And uh, one thing to note here is the optimizer also considers data movement costs. So you know, moving data between different clouds can be expensive because of the egress fee that you pay. Uh, so this optimizer takes into account uh, data movement costs. And then once a, a VM has been determined that we need to provision this on this cloud, uh, SkyPilot will go ahead and provision that for you and then hand off, once it's provisioned, hand it off to the executor component of SkyPilot, which will take care of you know, doing the setup, uh, running your job, getting your logs, and so on. Cool. Uh, one of the yeah. other big cost optimizations. Sorry, did you have a question? Uh, no, that, that sounds sounds cool. Cool. So, um, so another 
big cost optimization that SkyPilot does can do for you is the use of spot instances, which are cheaper VMs that are available on the cloud, but can be preempted at any time. For instance, here we have plotted the availability of uh, uh, V100 GPUs on AWS. And you can see this availability varies across time and both regions. So there are instances where V100s are available only on certain regions. Um, and there are instances where you know, they're not available anywhere at all. So if you, if you notice, spot VMs can be frequent, uh, preempted very frequently, and their availability changes across zones. So what SkyPilot does for you, it offers a managed spot uh, instance experience where you can simply submit uh, a job requesting spot instances. And if your instance gets preempted, SkyPilot will relaunch it wherever capacity is available. So for instance, you started running on one cloud or one region, and it ran out of spot instance capacity and it preempted your job, then SkyPilot will automatically restart your job wherever that spot capacity is available. And if, if your job includes automatic checkpointing and restore for, uh, for your workload, then it can automatically recover from where it was last running. So here's an example of like how this works in action where we had one of the, some of the ML researchers here at UC Berkeley use this managed spot experience to deal with, uh, to use spot instances to train their LLM. And, it, and they use SkyPilot to automatically deal with uh, preemptions that happened as their job was running. So whenever this preemption happened, uh, their workload would write checkpoints to an S3 or some cloud bucket. And then SkyPilot would restart the job elsewhere. And once the job was restarted, it would read again from this uh, bucket and resume training from wherever it left, wherever it was last preempted. Uh, Question: it's, where, where is that yeah. uh, checkpoint stored? Is that a, on a bucket, or is or is is it just like a simple file? Oh, I'm I'm curious. I don't know yeah, if, it, if, if you know about that. Um, I think one of the yeah the big concerns about training jobs, for example, is that they can take days, and and e even if you're using like or not using spot instances. Um, something can fail in it, but you don't want to re uh, restart from the beginning right so i'm just curious hmm. where, where that state actually gets stored yeah so the, the the state is stored on as you mentioned on cloud buckets so they use the file mounting feature in uh skypilot to automatically connect a bucket to a certain path on their remote virtual machine and their their application periodically writes these checkpoints, say every 10 epochs or every you know some iterations. And if a preemption happens, then it just restarts from the last checkpoint that was that was made. So we use these cloud buckets as kind of like a persistent storage for um for for spot instances because spot instances themselves are unreliable. Got it. So, but but it is up to the specific application to store these checkpoints. So if the application decides to store checkpoints once a day, that means they would actually have to go back to the previous day to to start, right? But if they do it like every every hour, they could go back just to one hour, right? So, depending on what the, what logic they build into the application. Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Um. Actually, that's that's one thing we explored, which is the idea of checkpointing process state without requiring any kind of like application semantics or like any knowledge of what the application is doing. Um, that's 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 possible for CPU only workloads. Uh, th there are some tools allow which allow you to do that, but for GPU workloads, it's really hard to checkpoint GPU state because. NVIDIA drivers are closed source, and it's really hard for you to look into exactly what's being stored in what registers on the GPU. And so you don't know exactly what state you need to dump out of the GPU to seamlessly be stored. That makes sense. Okay, so that's a challenge, I guess. Okay, thanks.
Cool. So um, I, I I talked about SkyPilot and how it sort of makes it really easy for you to run your workloads on any cloud. Uh, but really, we want to go beyond just the clouds. And we want, we heard a lot of users ask for support for either their on-prem resources or their cloud-hosted Kubernetes instances, because that's what their organizations use. So we, we, we've been hard at work and we, we've pushed out a beta support for Kubernetes, where we are trying to, you know, uh, not support not only cloud VMs, but also bring your own Kubernetes cluster and then SkyPilot can seamlessly plug into it and run your same workloads that you run on other clouds on Kubernetes as well. And at a very high level, uh, this is how it works. Uh, so we, you can draw some like very simple analogies. I know these are like very crude and maybe leaky at times, uh, but if you if you really think about it, like a cloud VM is analogous to a pod in Kubernetes, like you get a resource in the form of a VM or a pod. Um, instead of configuring firewall rules on the cloud, you can configure ingress rules, or if you have a load balancer service, then just create those load balancer services. Um, just like you have VM images on the cloud, you, you can use container images on Kubernetes. And just like you have object storage, you have persistent volumes on, on Kubernetes. So some of these concepts map really nicely between the cloud and Kubernetes world. So we sort of went ahead and uh, built this integration where you know SkyPilot, uh, the way it works is instead of provisioning a VM, SkyPilot provisions a pod or a set of pods which come together in a SkyPilot cluster. And um, one of the key things our users really like is the ability to SSH into their clusters or their pods. Like they don't want to deal with, they, they usually want an interactive development experience where you know they can SSH and see what's going on and debug and fix things if something's going wrong and like while they're running it. So the way we do it is we had to set up SSH access to all the pods that we provision. And the way we do this is uh, we use kube control port forward to sort of like uh, get access to a SSH jump pod that we run inside the Kubernetes cluster. And from this jump pod, we can reach different SkyPilot clusters or pods that a user might be running. Um, you, you were saying so, the customers want SSH access to their to their nodes, to their to their workloads. Um, can you can you talk about why that why that is? Yeah, so a lot of it stems from um, wanting to do interactive development. Uh, so, for instance, if if they have a training run going on, uh, they usually want to SSH in and maybe see GP stats. They want to see you know how are the logs looking at, like, what are the checkpoints that are being written, and so on. Uh, sometimes if something breaks, they want to quickly SSH in and you know just update a few files and then like start the run again. So um, it 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 sort of comes from like I guess like exposure exposure to Slurm and like using Slurm in academic environments where you know they can easily like S run or S batch into their workload and sort of like fix things there. Um, hmm. So that's why. SSH was sort of like a key component that people asked for. Interesting. Okay. I'm I'm sure the the stuff they want to do is pretty application specific as well. It'd be hard to kind of abstract uh like metrics maybe is one thing, but like status and specific things they want to tweak um might be challenging to abstract. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, like it's it's always like this tension between generality and then uh, picking the right interfaces for to achieve that generality. Um, and for us, it seemed like you know you want to give broad access because we are basically allowing people to run any shell script. So SSH seemed like the natural choice here. Okay. So we our our Kubernetes support is like in very early beta, and we are like 
talking to a few people who are using it right now. Um, and some of the things we, we talked to them and tried to figure out, hey, why do you not just use like, why don't you just like write a deployment YAML in Kubernetes, submit your own pod and just use that, right? Why use Skype? And some of the things people really like about Sky Pilot on Kubernetes is one, the ability to seamlessly spill over jobs to the cloud when your Kubernetes cluster is full. So this is useful in like hybrid cloud settings where you know uh, they have an on-prem cluster and also some cloud credits they want to use. And instead of you know, uh, instead of like submitting a job to Kubernetes and then realizing you don't have resources and then like porting the entire thing to the cloud, then uh, they really like the fact that Sky Pilot can like automatically do this for them. It also helps a lot of them idle, utilize their idle on-prem resources. And this is related to the first point <clears throat> where people don't exactly know when to use their cloud resources and when to use their on-prem resources. And SkyPilot through its optimizer automatically picks the uh, cheaper on-prem resources first. And if those are fully utilized, then it moves to using the cloud. And then finally, a lot of people like the SkyPilot features that uh, come with using SkyPilot. They want to use get the same experience on Kubernetes as well. Uh, and this includes things like you know our setup management, job execution, queuing that we support uh, natively, and of course like SSH access as we talked about. And all of this comes in a package that they think is uh, simpler to use than native Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Question about the spillover job. So that that actually means that the data needs to be stored in some object storage or something shared between the different resources, right? So otherwise, it wouldn't work, right? So like, so you uh, maybe you have some sort of caching data on on local storage on these nodes and or Kubernetes nodes and. Say if you have spillover jobs that go into VMs, then that data needs to be mm -hmm. uh, cached somewhere locally. And but but the actual data might be stored in some shared type of storage. Is that accurate or? Yeah, um, yeah, th that's a great point. Um, the the assumption here is your data is in some kind of cloud bucket that you either access on your Kubernetes cluster directly from the cloud or you have replicated your data, which is on your Kubernetes cluster onto a bucket as well. Um, and for, for, for some of our users, uh, doing that kind of replication isn't too hard because the amount of time or, or cost it takes to replicate that data is far smaller than the amount of compute time and cost that they will be spending on, on that data. So for them, it makes sense to optimize for this kind of utilization uh, than uh, you know showing their data in one place. Got it. Got it. If you did have some sort of a, a high performance storage requirement, that would mean that all the resources will have to kind of share the high performance storage, maybe. Right. So. Yeah. 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 One common mode of operation we see is, uh, so SkyPilot provides two ways to access uh, data on our object stores. It is either through fuse mounting, where we directly mount the files on your object store to your VM. And that, you know, whenever you request an object from the object stores, it's streamed in real time as you open a file. Uh, the other alternative is to use what we call a copy mode, where at, at initialization of your pod or VM, we copy over all the contents of that object store to your local disk, and then you can use it locally. So it's cached locally, and then you know you get high performance. So we sort of provide these knobs to the users to sort of pick, hey, do you want performance, or do you want to uh, keep your data on the object store and not worry about like copying it at the start if it's too big? That makes sense. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, um, in the demo you were showing before, uh, a Kubernetes uh, option was filtered out because it, it didn't have GPUs, I think. Um, mm -hmm. 
is that just because that particular Kubernetes cluster didn't, or is the uh, do, does it uh, not take into account Kubernetes clusters that have GPU resources available? Yeah, so that, that was because my Kubernetes cluster doesn't have GPUs. Like it's it's only a CPU only cluster. Uh, but if you if you have a GPU enabled cluster, uh, we work with that too. Uh, so if you if you basically have the NVIDIA GPU operator installed, then then we can we can work with that. Okay, good. And then um, right now, is the support just for a single Kubernetes cluster, or could you have an on-prem cluster and then a cloud managed cluster, and it would be able to go between? Yeah, that's. That's that's actually one of the biggest feature requests we've been hearing from people okay. they, where they want to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we want to get to it soon. So you know, if anyone's interested in contributing that, please, uh, we'd be very happy to see that. Okay, thanks. Um, just a general question: Is that checkpoints is more like? disaster recovery policy or not is it not there yet um so there for two two reasons one is um if you're using spot instances uh, uh you yeah so if, if you're using spot instances those instances can be preempted at any time by the cloud right so that's like an expected disaster that's going to happen soon uh, and that's that's one way to uh, that's one way to use checkpoints. The other reason is for just to get the outputs of a job. Like once your job completes, you want the model that was trained, and people use those checkpoints. The last checkpoint as you know the output of your job. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that that brings me to the end of uh, what I have on the slides. But I'm I'd be you know I wanted to open the floor for discussion and you know any thoughts you guys may have on this. Uh, so you know there there are like three broad things when I think about Kubernetes uh, with SkyPilot. So the model I just presented to you is the idea of having SkyPilot run on Kubernetes instead of running underneath Kubernetes. And what that means is instead of you know Skypilot running its jobs as pods, is it possible for Skypilot to run underneath Kubernetes where you know people submit their classic Kubernetes deployment YAMLs? Uh, they don't have to you know learn the Skypilot YAML. And under the hood, Skypilot takes care of you know provisioning the right resources across different clouds and regions and then attaching them to your Kubernetes cluster. So really like thinking of it as like a cluster autoscaler that's, you know, multi-cloud, multi-location, and, uh, you know, with some objective function like minimizing cost and so on. And a related question to this is, um, I, I haven't seen a lot of people do like multi-region Kubernetes where, you know, people tend to want to have their one control plane running in only one data center or one region. Um, I don't know why this is a trend. I'm not super familiar with Kubernetes. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think about, you know, people wanting to run multi-region Kubernetes clusters and so on. Um, and then finally, there's, you know, some, some thoughts on like, um, NVIDIA should maybe do more on like how to standardize labeling for GPUs on Kubernetes. Um, right now it's really hard for, you know, someone developing something like SkyPilot to know exactly what GPU type is available on a cluster. Like the abstraction we get right now is you get a resource called nvidia.com slash GPU. And you know, it has an integer capacity and you can request some integer off of it. But if you have a heterogeneous cluster with like different GPU types, it's really hard for me to know which node has A100 versus which node has V100 versus some other GPU. So a very simple way is to have just like Kubernetes labels attached to each node, which tells you know what GPU type is there. Uh, and NVIDIA GPU operator does that, but they don't release what exact labels they use. So unless you have access to the exhaustive set of GPUs that are out there and put them in a Kubernetes cluster and see what GPU operator assigns them as labels, 
you don't know what label to request in your application. So um, that's maybe a call to action for, for NVIDIA folks, if there are any here. The last point, uh, I don't know if we have anybody for NVIDIA here, but we do have some folks in the community. So uh, if you reach out to me afterwards, uh, I can put you in contact with them. Uh, I don't know if they're specifically working on the labeling of Kubernetes clusters, but I think they might be able to find folks working on that and might be able to help out in that area. But just just ping me afterwards. Yeah, that'll, that'll be super useful because as a workaround right now, we have like written our own daemon sets, which basically when, when you run SkyPilot on Kubernetes, it basically goes to each node queries the GPU type and then generates a standard label according to what we think should be a standard label and then uses that. But ideally we would like just, you know, the NVIDIA GPU operator to do this for us. Yeah, another thought on that is the uh, uh, Kubernetes community is working on a feature called um, DRA, dynamic resource allocation. And basically that's meant to dynamically uh, change the, the GPU partitioning in a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, mm -hmm. get in contact with those folks, but I, I can, you can ping me afterwards and I can let you know who, who to contact, I think. That'd be awesome. Cool, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if any of you have thoughts on, you know, why people don't do multi-region Kubernetes. Uh, like some people say, you know, the latency between data centers is too high for HCD to cope up with. Um, but I, I don't know. I've never tried it. Yeah. Oh, I've seen... oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, you can go as well. Uh, just, just want to say basically that's kind of where it starts from. Uh, from a control plane standpoint, the, uh, the control plane typically likes to be close to itself. Uh, what you can do is have the control plane, you know, across availability zones within one region, if your cloud supports that. Um, so you have the, the lower latency and then, you know, the, the cluster itself, like where the workloads run and the workers, those could potentially be in other data centers, um, as long as you can link back to the control plane properly. So that might be an option um, to kind of run your control plane w one place and then distribute your, your workloads um, if, if that helps you. So, sorry, Sean. No, that's good. Uh, I was just gonna add the, the other thing I've seen is that um, as far as the uh, people using that cluster and deploying workloads is um, most of the time they don't wanna have to think about extra configuration and there's for certain environments, there's a risk if you have nodes in multiple regions, then you need to actually think, be aware of that and uh, um, contain tolerations or, or label to to try to make sure that your workloads that need that should be together stay together within one region in that cluster. So a lot of times what I see is um, rather than having a cluster that spans multiple regions, it's easier sometimes just having multiple clusters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And and if people have these multiple, you know, many Kubernetes clusters, like how do they typically manage all these like different clusters? Like, is are there like some standard tooling out there that people prefer to use, or does everyone like build their own thing in house? Uh, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are things like EKS CTL, for example, to manage uh, EKS clusters, multiple regions in AWS, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I think it really depends on the organization, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But the multi-region, there's a there's another another twist to to this. Uh, there's a project called Cube Edge, and I think there are some others too that actually allow you to have a centralized Kubernetes cluster and have uh, nodes in remote locations at the edge. So it has a mechanism of moving data between the edge and 
this a centralized location. So something, yeah, it might be worth looking into that, into one of those projects and trying to understand some of the patterns, uh, if you're interested in that. And and, and I think uh, it might be interested, interesting from the point of view of running AI inference jobs at the edge, because I think a lot of organizations are using it that way. Like for example, they mm -hmm. have, a, a, it, it's more predictive type of AI jobs, for example, like, like a camera uh, picking up uh, license plates uh, at a uh, toll booth and then and and then send that data over to a centralized location um, but you know it's something worth looking at uh, uh, you know in terms of understanding use cases yeah th thanks ricardo i was trying to remember that the name of that project as well um i guess the turn the question back to you ramil why are you looking to run multi-region kubernetes uh, yeah, I think, you know, when, when we were building SkyPilot, um, there seemed to be a lot of parallels with Kubernetes and the way, you know, the, the promise of, a, you know, one Kubernetes control plane spanning across all different clouds and regions was very, like, sounded very appealing in theory, right? Because you can then just, like, submit tasks to it, and maybe you have your own custom scheduler on top of it, which, you know, picks which region, which cloud to run a workload on. Um, and that seemed very attractive to me uh, in the sense that, you know, there's, there's one control plane to rule them all. Uh, but looks like that's not a suggested or even like a recommended practice simply because, you know, it's it's hard to have a control plane spanning across regions. And, you know, if nodes fail, if network fails and so on, it's uh, it just gets harder to manage. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think I would say um, best practice typically is run running multiple clusters in each of those regions and having something intelligence above it. Um, I know, uh, uh, for example, ByteDance just uh, open sourced their um, multi-cluster orchestration platform. Um, I believe that's the Cube Admiral. Um, mm -hmm. And that's... Yeah. A ability to deploy workloads across different clouds, but the they're all running separate clusters underneath in each of those environments. Mm -hmm. Another option. Yeah, and uh, QBH has a mechanism uh, that allows the, the cluster to uh, be sensitive to uh, outages or network outages because um, edge locations might be having an outage at some time, you know, because, you know, they're in remote locations and maybe there's less power. I don't know. I mean, anything can happen at, at a remote location. So they have a mechanism to uh, to understand that and 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 and, and take some action or, or, or wait until that... Um, the auto is uh, fixed. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's kind of worth looking into that to understand some of the patterns. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when, um, when you were talking about the, the Sky Pilot use cases before, um, it was kind of like the users didn't care necessarily where it, where it was running because they don't, typically run latency sensitive applications. They just kind of want the compute or the GPU to be available. Do you, do you see cases where like an, an edge deployment is preferred or, you know, running a workload closer to particular users or, or locations is, is important? Okay. Um, I think we 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 are starting to see that as people start productionizing these LLMs, uh, a lot of them do have uh, actually more than latency sensitivity. It's more to like data governance, where people don't want uh, mm -hmm. workloads LLMs that are served in Europe should be running in Europe. Like they don't want them to be running in Asia, for example. Um, 
And that's that's one of the bigger location constraints that we are starting to see now. Uh, latency st still sort of remains not a big concern because these LMs themselves, the application itself, like has a latency of a few seconds in itself. And so it's unlike you know web servers where they can like return a response in like milliseconds. Uh, the cost of the network round trip is much smaller. Uh, compared to the latency cost of the application itself. So if if instead of like five seconds, it takes like 5.2 seconds to complete a query, um, people are still okay with that, at least as of today. I'm sure that's going to change in a few years. Sure. Yeah, data, data governance is, yeah, so organizations also, private organizations, they want to keep their data in-house, right? So. So not only like, you know, if you have internet wide data where some of these LLMs are trained on the, that's, you know, whether that data is in Europe or that data is in North America, that's, that's one issue. But then there's the, the other issue of like enterprises, you know, having private data that they want to use to train, uh, uh, language model doesn't have to be large, right? But could be a small, a small language model, right? So then they want to use local data, right? Then in their enterprise. Yeah. So that's, that's another concern that it's something that I'm, a, a pattern that we may see in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest drivers. Uh, data governance, people wanting to, you know, retain control of their data. Cool. I, I think we're also out of time, so I won't hold up this meeting for longer. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone. This was super useful. Uh, if you guys have more feedback, uh, send it our way. We just put an issue on GitHub. And if you're interested in contributing to the project, we'd be very happy to you know, uh, hear more about that. Yeah, thank you very much. And 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 then if you have any follow ups too, we have the tag runtime channel. So just ping any of us, and we're happy to help. Of course. And then we didn't talk about whether this might be a uh, you wanted to join the CNCF, but if you're interested also in in, in joining the CNCF, the uh, you know we can discuss that on offline. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.